the director of the Center for Policy Studies. It's fantastic to welcome Eliza Zobby here uh, to talk about her new book, God and Mrs. Thatcher. It's a brilliantly researched and written uh, examination of the interrelationship between religion and politics in uh, post-war Britain. And it contains a number of par fascinating paradoxes uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the whole book. Uh, I'll just mention three very briefly. First of all, we have the most religious prime minister since William Gladstone in office, who comes to office. And yet, who is her most vocal opponent? The Church of England. <laughs> Paradox two. <laughs> the Church of England and the Conservative Party. Uh, are both supposedly greatly in favour of tradition and uh, the preservation of society, yet both organisations have an extraordinary ability to reinvent themselves over uh, uh, the 20th century, arguably the Conservative Party more successfully than the Church of England. <laughs> <laughs> um, my third paradox, before I speak, is that uh, though as Eliza describes brilliantly, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was informed by a very clear and strong sense of religious and moral conviction. According to Eliza, and here we disagree, uh, her policies signaled the end of Christian Britain. <laughs> it's not a book with which we <laughs> agree, I, I agree uh, with every word, uh, but that makes, it all, uh, makes Eliza all the more welcome. We, 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 we appreciate uh, challenges to our conditions. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to firstly thank Tim um, for that kind introduction and for the Centre for Policy Studies uh, for inviting me here tonight to speak, and particularly Jenny Nicholson, who has done such a sterling job in organising the event. Um, the title of my talk, rather provocatively, is Thatcherism owes more to Methodism than monetarism. And there is perhaps no uh, more appropriate place than the CPS in which to give this lecture, <laughs> given its pivotal role in the history of Thatcherism, which in many respects was as important as Margaret Thatcher herself. Back in 1980, The Guardian described the CPS as the patala of monetarism manned by fanatical llamas which in fact actually was quite tempered compared to how those in the Conservative Research Department, the in-house party think tank, actually was referring to the CPS at the time. <laughs> Leading Almost CPS man Alfred Sherman was in fact content to be dismissed as a crackpot by the Conservative Party and the left. He reveled in the CPS's outsider status and considered his chief raison d'etre to challenge the consensus um, driven establishment thinking that had governed Britain since the Second World War. And in the early years of the CPS, it perhaps might be comparable to John Wesley's band of Methodists in the 18th century. The Methodists had of course begun as a holy club within the University of Oxford, <laughs> there to challenge the self-serving and unholy preoccupations of the established church. Like the CPS, Wesley's men too suffered abuse at the hands of the establishment. The label Methodists had originated as a derogatory term given to Wesleyans because of their so-called pious and purist approach to life. Similarly, Sherman conceived the CPS's role in missionary terms, converting first the Conservative Party and then the British people to economic liberalism. Sherman himself was, of course, a convert to the cause who had fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Communists and personally therefore knew of the battle that lie ahead in potentially capitalising on the popular disillusionment with the left. If those in the 1970s here at the CPS were evangelical in their method, they were also iconoclastic in their approach. Spurred on by ap ap apocalyptic fears of national decline, Sherman and those at the CPS, including, of course, Mrs. Thatcher, bulldozed their way through Britain's New Jerusalem and herald, heralded monetarism as the true godly path. They indulged in some ideological grave digging, resurrecting the figures of Burke, Hume, and Adam Smith, 
proclaimed their faith in the prophets of the Chicago School in America, locked arms with their brothers at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and forged a program and a set of ideas <coughs> which was as ideological, dogmatic, and as comprehensive as the socialism they were determined to defeat. Few then could doubt the religious zealotry and fundamentalist air to neo that, that was led to the neoliberalist movement in Britain in the mid-1970s. Speaking of his conversion experience, Keith Joseph famously remarked, <coughs> it was only in April 1974 that I was converted to con conservatism. I had thought I was a conservative, but now I see that I was not really one at all. But whereas both Alfred Sherman and Keith Joseph's conversion was intellectual, <coughs> Margaret Thatcher's was instinctive. Thatcher was, of course, inspired by her readings of Hayek and Milton Friedman, but only in the way that they reinforced her natural instincts. In Alfred Sherman's words, she was a woman of beliefs rather than ideas. For the origins of Mrs. Thatcher's beliefs, then, we must not look here in the seminar rooms of the CPS, nor to the road to serfdom, but to the pulpit of Finken Street Methodist Church in her hometown of Grantham, Lincolnshire. And indeed, to the chief influence in her life, her father, counsellor, grocer, and Methodist <coughs> and preacher, Alf Roberts. Margaret Thatcher once described Grantham as her Bloomsbury. For those familiar with this small market town in the East Midlands, Grantham is about as far from Bloomsbury as you could possibly get. <laughs> the origins of Thatcherism lie in a similar time, the interwar period, but in a world away, in the heartlands of a lost England, provincial Grantham, and more specifically, in the non-conformist teachings that dominated then Margaret Roberts's childhood. <clears throat> Although Thatcher would later electorally triumph in the new towns of southern suburbia, she was not, importantly, a product of it. Grantham, in contrast, was then shaped by its aristocratic connections, its old industries, and its traditional vocations. Alfred Roberts may have risen into the middle class, but as a self-employed grocer, he was not of professional rank. Instead, the Robertses were members of the most fluid, and I would say frustrated, section of British society, the lower middle class. Those that tend to take a disparaging view of the established middle class, who do not need to strive, and of course the lower class, who do not bother. I <laughs> 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 that you would agree with that. <laughs> Our lives revolved around Methodism, so said Margaret Thatcher. And even by interwar standards, her religious upbringing would have been considered austere. Viewed through, today, th viewed through the lens of today's post-Christian Britain, it seems positively archaic. Her family would say grace both before and after every meal, while her parents were teetotalers and only kept an old dusty bottle of sherry in the house for guests. And this was a fact that was a cause of great frustration when, of course, the gin-loving Dennis Thatcher <laughs> first met <laughs> his future in-laws. Strict Sabbatarians, the Robertses would attend chapel not once, but three times on a Sunday. And on Sunday, board games, sewing, and even newspapers were forbidden fruits. For us, it was rather a sin to enjoy yourself by entertainment, Margaret Thatcher once wrote. Life was to work and to do things. If you visit Finken Street Methodist Church today, you will find it a cold, imposing stone building. Indeed, an abandoned shell to Britain's lost, non-conformist <coughs> past. But if you venture inside, you will find the layout, the spatial representation of a priesthood of believers, with no altar separating the shepherd from the sheep. All eyes are directed towards the organ, for the, hymn, for, the, for the hymns, and of course, the elevated pulpit for that, what is of course the climax of the Methodist worship, the sermon. Here, now, I want you to imagine Alf Roberts standing in the pulpit at over six foot tall with his shock white albino white hair 
and commanding sermon voice, almost generating the air of an Old Testament prophet. And there, sitting in the pews, row four, is the young Margaret. If we have this image then, what of his words? Thankfully, a collection of his sermon notes dating between 1941 to 1945 were kept by Margaret Thatcher and are now housed in her personal archive. These handwritten notes were jotted down at the back of his daughter's chemistry book, probably then due to the shortage of paper during the war. Within these sermon notes, appropriately, there is, of course, as befitting a nonconformist, an emphasis on individual salvation and, of course, the Protestant work ethic. A lazy man, he told the congregation, has lost his soul already. <laughs> Likewise, much on the virtue of thrift. And as Thatcher later commented, before I ever read a page of Milton Friedman or Alan Waters, I just knew that thrift was a virtue and profligacy was a vice. It's perhaps not without irony that Margaret Thatcher oversaw the largest <coughs> expansion in personal debt in British history. <laughs> Contained within the sermon notes are also instructions to prospective preachers and what it takes to lead and inspire a following. First, it demanded, her father said, absolute conviction. Well, we can tick, Margaret Thatcher definitely had that. <laughs> Secondly, he warned it would be a slog. Your task demands and deserves sheer hard work, sweat of brains and discipline of soul. Tick. Margaret Thatcher was the living embodiment of the Protestant work ethic. <laughs> Finally, he warned, never allow yourself to become aloof and out of touch with the realities of other man, men's lives. Now this is perhaps a sentiment that Margaret Thatcher should have perhaps remembered when she doggedly pursued the ill-fated poll tax in her final years. I think more than any of her contemporaries, Margaret Thatcher, a daughter of a preacher, self-consciously embraced the style and tone of a preacher, seeking to convert the people to her cause. But what is most striking in the sermons of Alf Roberts is his application of faith to politics. In a coded reference to the leading debate of interwar politics, protectionism versus free trade, Roberts, for example, maintained that just as there should be no tariff, and was no tariff on God's grace, nor should there be a tariff on the consumer goods. <laughs> this doctrinal legitimation of the invisible hand echoed that, of course, of 19th century free trade liberals and was one that his daughter would enunciate with equal passion 40 years later. <clears throat> As would be expected of a dissenter, Alfred Roberts also extolled the virtues of religious liberty and condemned its opposite. Significantly, though, he denounced the closed shop on union membership as the contemporary form of uniformity, that which infringed on personal freedom. Likewise, he offered a similar rebuke on totalitarianism, which in his words led to the dehumanisation of man. Tellingly, Thatcher, of course, would later echo these sentiments in her ideological battle against communism. <clears throat> Writing in 1951, just as the Labour government was putting its post-war plan of reconstruction into action, her father offered the congregation a warning of those that put too much faith in temporal rather than spiritual power. He was also equally sceptical of the church's involvement in social affairs, arguing that social issues turned the house of God into nothing more than a glorified discussion group. Margaret Thatcher would, of course, make a similar point in a speech famously to the Church of Scotland in 1988, <coughs> in which she argued, Spirit Christianity is about spiritual redemption, not social reform. According to her father, though, <coughs> writing in the, the mid-1940s, the real threat in the modern world was not poverty, but affluence. While he also viewed speculation in the realm of finance as institutionalised gambling. Indeed, the struggle of how to morally square the free market with the materialistic culture it created and the casino capitalism it encouraged was something his daughter would grapple with throughout her premiership. Alf Roberts began his voting life in 1918 
but by the late 1940s, he had become a committed, um, he had begun his life, uh, voting life as a liberal in 1918, but by the 1940s had become a committed conservative. And in Alf Roberts' journey, we see the key shift in 20th century British politics. The movement of lower middle class nonconformists from the Liberal Party to the Conservatives. Margaret Thatcher was, of course, every inch a die in the wall Tory. I could hardly say anything but in this. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, her political heritage was liberal nonconformist. When Margaret Thatcher, uh, <coughs> Margaret, then Margaret Roberts, first arrived in Oxford as a student, she was involved, involved in the local chapel and became a lay preacher, literally following in the footsteps of John Wesley, delivering sermons on the local circuit. And indeed, it is perhaps worth remembering that Margaret Thatcher was a preacher before she was a politician. Most importantly, however, amidst the chaotic years of the 1970s, Margaret Thatcher returned to her nonconformist roots. She found that economic arguments against bloated state spending suited her instruction on the principles of thrift. Theoretical notions of state interference went hand in hand with her understanding on the foundations of individual liberty, while the desire for moral and economic restraint fed into her innate Puritanism. Her upbringing in Grantham had instilled a class, religious and political identity that was to be reawakened in the mid-1970s. As Alfred Sherman later said, the first 18 years of her life in Puritan England shaped her forever. For her, God was a real presence. In part, I may have helped her recognise the significance of Grantham, but much of Grantham was embodied in her, waiting to emerge. When bidding for the Conservative leadership in 75 and again for Downing Street in 1979, it was not to Hayek, Smith or Friedman upon which Margaret Thatcher based her popular appeal, but the teachings of her nonconformist childhood. Tales of self-reliance, hard work and moral <coughs> restraint were posited as the sober antidote for a nation crippling under the constraints of excessive bureaucracy, industrial strife and economic decline. It was therefore no accident that the former lay preacher chose to recite a prayer on the steps of Number 10 Downing Street. The conviction politics of the Iron Lady sought to satisfy a thirst for certainty in an age of profound doubt. And yet Thatcher did not simply use Christianity for rhetorical ornamentation. It was the starting point and indeed the end point for her politics and her political values. Economics is the method, she said to the Times in 1981, the object is to change the soul. Unlike Tony Blair, who was famously muzzled whenever he attempted to do God, Margaret Thatcher showed no such restraint. She frequently drew on the Bible to justify her politics, be it on the interview sofa, in Parliament, or even from the pulpit. The gospel, according to Margaret Thatcher, amounted to a belief in the sovereignty of liberty, individual responsibility, and human fallibility. It was a gospel that placed the individual at the centre of the spiritual and political world. It is to individuals that the Ten Commandments are addressed, she would point out, adding, we are called on to repent our own sins, not each other's sins. Thatcher too liked to remind her audiences that free will was, after all, at the heart of the Bible. The choice between eternal salvation and eternal damnation. Her contention was that as the Christian faith was a call to individuals, so the relationship between the citizen and the state should operate along the same lines. The notion of free will that had historically been used by nonconformists to challenge an overbearing church was appropriated by Thatcher to challenge an overbearing state. The Good Samaritan could only have helped because he had money, Thatcher famously proclaimed in 1968. In her view, the Christian duty to love thy neighbour could not be manufactured by politicians, nor generated through taxation, but only through individual initiative. With more money in our pockets, we would not turn into yuppies, 
we would all become good Samaritans. We would not walk on by the other side, nor would we need state-imposed state traffic lights to guide us there. In this understanding of social obligation, Thatcher showed herself not as a rampant individualist or as a liber libertarian, but much more in line with American Catholic theologian Michael Novak, and indeed evangelical economist Brian Griffiths, who was head of her policy unit from 1986. She was interested in the positive case for capitalism, one that talked about the fact that it complemented rather than contradicted Christianity. She wanted the positive case put that greater freedom would encourage civic and social responsibility. Behind all this Bible bashing was, of course, a distinct political aim. To wrestle the moral mantle from socialism and to discredit the then widely held notion that it was inherently virtuous. On the international front, Thatcher's Christianity was also a key part of her ideological counteroffensive against communism. Indeed, more than any British leader other than Churchill, Margaret Thatcher was willing to elevate the Cold War as Cold War into one about values. A battle, in this case, between atheistic communism and Western Christianity. This was a crusade that was, of course, shared by those two other leading Western leaders in the Cold War, Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II. When the Soviet Empire was finally defeated, Thatcher heralded, heralded it as not an economic or a diplomatic success, but a moral victory, almost as if it was an act of divine providence. Many Christians, including Methodists, would spend a large part of the 1980s repudiating the gospel of Thatcherism. And yet, as unpalatable as her ideas were to modern churchmen, they had legitimate roots in 19th century evangelical thought, and even much further back to the Reformation. They were also largely in tune with what Thatcher had learned from her father. In essence, she never strayed too far from those Sundays spent at Finken Street Methodist Church. With a former preacher then at the helm, Thatcherism in Britain would come to be promoted and packaged like a religion. It would be believed with conviction like a religion. It would have notable converts like a religion. And would, of course, eventually cause a sharp divide within the nation, like the religious wars of centuries past. <clears throat> Thatcherite values that of economic and individual freedom, patriotism, populism, and a belief in a social order cannot then be understood in purely secular terms, not least because the chief exponent of these values never <coughs> conceived them as such. If we talk, as many people do, of Margaret Thatcher's Victorian values, we should, perhaps, more specifically define them as non-conformist values. That is, assume precepts about God, man, and how these translate into the temporal sphere. Where critics go wrong within their assessment of Thatcherism is that they assume there was only economic rather than moral thinking behind it. Where its admirers go wrong, I believe, is that they do not admit that there was a fundamental discrepancy between Margaret Thatcher's virtuous intentions and the actual outcomes. The Britain that Margaret Thatcher left behind was a nation addicted to credit rather than thrift, a society that prioritised individual gain rather than social responsibility, and prized moral freedom over rectitude. As the crash of 2008 has proved, the market has failed to live up to the Christian vision which Thatcher so fervently proclaimed, while the British state and its public have displayed a rather dysfunctional relationship with capitalism, I would argue particularly in respect to personal debt. Tonight, I do not have, to have time, unfortunately, to delve into Margaret Thatcher's personal piety, her theological and political battle with the Tory party at prayer, the Church of England, <laughs> and nor the fact that Thatcher considered it her greatest regret that she had not instilled a sense of fiscal and chariti charitable responsibility amongst the wealthy. For this and much, much more, I urge you to buy the book. <laughs>
very kindly uh, agreed to take uh, a, a few questions. Um, and I can see a number of uh, advisors to Mrs. Satcher who knew her extremely well, which I didn't think advisor <laughs> could quite clear. Um, so any, any questions? Yeah. I wasn't an advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you did know her well. I did know her well. Um, you make your very interesting and pertinent point at the end of the discrepancy between Mrs. Thatcher's moral crusade and actually the state of society um, at when she left office as the most perhaps individualistic, self-indulgent, etc. You've used the terms very well. I wonder whether, though, you haven't missed out an extraordinarily huge aspect of the reason for that, which was nothing to do with Mrs. Thatcher herself, which was a reflection of her lack of power <coughs> over society in those times, which was the extraordinarily cultural, liberal, left revolution that had totally encapsulated society and most of the rest of the different asset levels of establishment. Namely, I would say the hugest area in that time was local authority control and control over education, which was left it had very little to do <coughs> with the type of um, evangelism and Methodism that you describe um, lay behind Mrs. Thatcher's sort of thinking and dynamism. Uh, so in a way, I, I wonder, I put it to you, she was not a powerful or... Con mm. You're overestimating it, her power right. in, in a society that was yes. moving in an exactly opposite direction. Mm -hmm. a highly socialistically libertarian individualist direction, which is an entirely different form of individualism. That's very true. And I think that um, the first thing I would say about that is the one thing that I, I, I sort of do in the book is, is, is not only chart um, the Bush, Bush and Britain's <coughs> changing relationship with economics, but also its changing relationship with morality and religion. So, and that's obviously something that Mrs. Thatcher doesn't really obviously have She's an anachronism, is, I think is what well, I want to say in a way. <coughs> what I think, um, two things I would say there is that in one sense she does try and challenge the local authorities. Obviously the Education Act of 1988 in which Christianity is made explicit as part of the Act um, and the teaching of RE has a special status as part of the national curriculum. So there is an attempt to sort of almost kind of instill a sort of, you know, um, level of moral teaching and commitment to Christianity. Um, but um, also Section 28, you could arguably say, is, is Mrs. Thatcher's attempt to sort of counteract the influence of, of the local councils. But actually, Section 28 was not something she was particularly committed to, not something she particularly uh, personally initiated, and was really a sop to her, her backbenchers at a time when, you know, obviously there's an election coming up, and Section 28 was a really convenient way of discrediting the, the loony left um, at a time of general election. So I think that, <clears throat> I don't want to say that Mrs. Thatcher was determined to impose a sort of moral crusade on Britain. Um, she didn't see herself as the political Billy Graham, you know. Um, she actually, particularly when it, when it comes to um, what she was particularly interested in, is not, wasn't personal morality. Her faith was never moralistic in that sense. She was incredibly naive about sex. She, was she had, took no interest in sexual morality, saw it as like constitutional reform, a, a diversion from the courts. Um, so she wasn't moralistic in that sense, uh, whereas there were certain members in her party that were obviously very much keen on pursuing a much more uh, anti-permissive agenda. Um, she, never, she never was. Um, what she was interested in was in values, um, and, and particularly values in respect to the state and respect to economics. Um, and I think that um, in that sense, she did ultimately fail. Um, in um, in recalibrating Britain's relationship with 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 its economy, I, I think that one of the lasting, most damaging impact impact of the 1980s, and it, I'm not just blaming Margaret Thatcher, I'm blaming New Labour as well, um, in, in encouraging this culture of debt. Um, Britain has the largest personal levels of personal debt in the Western world, and much of that is down to. The, 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 the encouragement of certain behaviours in the 1980s under Mrs Thatcher's watch. 
So I suppose I'd separate personal issues about personal morality from issues about kind of you know, the virtues of the economic system. Yeah. Howard, and then Tom, and then Richard. Yeah, my, my parents were born at the beginning of the last century, and I was brought up very much with the same uh, the same sort of values of that chap. And I felt I always understood her without even having to discuss it. Um, I don't think she was that keen on religion per se, but she was quite rightly imbued with the values of the Methodist background she grew up with. Uh, Charles Moore's book you know, brings out wonderfully how she practiced what she preached, and she didn't believe in the state doing everything, she believed in the duty of individuals to act in a, a decent way towards their neighbours, and I think no <coughs> other Prime Minister has had the principles of personal decency uh, that she showed uh, in the, for, for, well, for at least a hundred years, if not longer than that. Um, it did have its political input, we talked about that, but um, I don't think she was trying to turn Britain into a uh, dissenting religious society. She was just, you know, where she stood both economically and in other ways was the values with which she was brought up uh, and, and how she saw things. And I repeat, for better or worse, I find myself exactly the same. Yes, I mean, it's very, it's very, um, it's very troubling when we talk about someone's faith and their religion, because there's lots of things associated with that, the personal piety, the community of faith. I mean, most of her ministers that I spoke to, um, including, uh, including all of who's here tonight, said she never mentioned religion, exactly. never heard her talk about it at all. Exactly. Never heard her talk about it at all. Um, and I do remember spending rather a lot of time at the House of Lords interviewing her former ministers thinking, is there a subject for a book here? Because I'm not getting anything. <laughs> I'm not getting anything. Um, and it was almost like it felt like I was going, you know, in search of Citizen Kane's Rosebud, because this sort of, you know, was Mrs. Thatcher a Christian? And I get sort of snippets saying, oh, she wasn't afraid, you know, Brighton, Brighton bomb, you know, it's, yeah. But but I suppose the conclusion I come to in the book is that when you talk about religion, um, I'm when I talk about Margaret Thatcher's religion. I'm not strictly talking about a faith in kind of conventional, explicit terms. I'm talking about her political values, the source of her political values. So when people say, oh, she never talked about religion, she never talked about, of course she didn't, because they were, it was so inherent um, and so, so ingrained in her um, and a fundamental part of her beliefs, then, you know, that it was often not articulated in explicitly Christian terms. But I think... Our failure to understand Margaret Thatcher's faith is actually a reflection of our secular society, because she was bred in a time. Uh, she was born in a time um, when you know there was an, um, people's class, religion, and politics were a set of indistinguishable allegiances, and we don't have that anymore. We don't have that that, that such a strong Christian culture, and I think there's a clear difference. And in fact, Lord Carey, former Archbishop of Canterbury, um, highlighted this: a difference between Tony Blair, the convert, <coughs> and Margaret Thatcher, the cradle Christian. Mm -hmm. And that that different in expression, mm -hmm. and that different in, in just the articulation of one's faith. I think is, I think is the was... easiest way of explaining, I suppose, what I mean when I talk about Margaret Thatcher's religious values. And, and, and I suppose the phrase I use in the book is a theopolitical outlook. Um, I think it was the values and the principles and everything else. I don't think she was particularly interested in religious belief, per se. No, but, but then, I mean, she did spend 1988 reading the Old Testament. And you don't do that if you're not particularly interested in... Well, you want to uh, look, look at Syria. I mean, you can't understand <laughs> that part of religion. <laughs> but she, I mean, she did read an awful lot of religious books, and she was engaged with, um, you know, people like Brian Griffiths. You know, Michael Snowman. What's the term? <laughs> um, but also, you know, she was, she was incredibly interested in, in uh, the writings of Jonathan Sachs, and, and obviously her, her real her spiritual soulmate was the chief rabbi, the then chief rabbi. Um, and she had an affiliation to um, the Jewish faith, um, not just one that was born out of political experience. Well, it wasn't just an I, I think she was a very much an Old Testament girl. <laughs> and I think there was a certain, you know, um, affinity with um, the Jewish faith 
and then certainly the chief rabbi who publicly spoke out and defended her government when the Church of England did it, um, and were criticising her, there was a, there was a degree of, of, of sympathy um, between those two. But just the point you made about practising what she preached, I think what's really interesting about Margaret Thatcher, and such a rare thing in politicians, is that she really did practise what she preached Absolutely. in terms of thrift, um, you know, um, all, all of the, um, you know, she took her own cutlery and ironing board into number 10. She raided <laughs> Admiralty House for furniture. She berated the Welsh Secretary for spending too much on refurbishing his Cardiff residency. I mean, you know, old curtains were turned into coats for the twins. You know, she was absolutely, <laughs> she was absolutely You know, she, she maintained her mother's standards on that respect. Um, she, I think also um, in terms of work ethic, I mean, obviously, you know, what other prime minister or indeed politician has has such is there such an obsession with their sleeping habits? You know, clearly there was a there was a it was a political advantage to have a fe the first female leader associated with sort of a sort of masculine tenacity. Yeah, she only sleeps four hours a, four hours a night, but she genuinely, you know, she. Work. She was always working. She's always in every photo. She's on the go. She's always doing. Uh, even if she's sitting on her couch with her, you know, heels kicked off, reading her red box. You know, she's she's the living embodiment, or was the living embodiment of the Boston work ethic. And that is definitely something she practiced, and obviously she also. But the dissent of tradition was all about workaholism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Trump. Um, it's sort of um, so many. It's such a rich talk and from reading it so far, it's such a um, rich book, there's so many things we could pick up on, but sort of two points on origins. One in terms of what you might call the deep origins is how non-conformist is this really? Because if one looks at Boyd Hilton's works on the origins of classical liberal economics in the 19th century as a practical theory of government, he talks, and most of these people are Anglicans and often conservatives rather than liberals, um, about a heavily based and moralistic idea that you shouldn't be living on other people's um, labour or other people's wealth. Um, so to what degree is this really a sort of broader 19th century evangelical tradition that crosses the non-conformist Anglican boundaries and potentially explains why the young Margaret Thatcher didn't really seem to regard herself as a liberal. She was quite happy with conservatives in Grantham and Oxford um, because it represented a common tradition rather than just a sort of Gladstonian tradition. And secondly, in terms of religion, of course, I think Gladstone is probably quite an interesting point there because Gladstone unlike Thatcher, kept this very detailed diary, so we know he's obsessed with religion the entire time. But actually, he was very careful not to talk about religion in political context. So I think that potentially speaks, it's it always striking to me that people who are quite close, quite a lot of people who are quite close to like David Willits, who are quite secular, talks how for her morality was all about religion. And he, he was terrible, and she relied on John Rawls, who much more people believe it than the Bible, apparently. But, um, <laughs> Um, but the, um, so I was the second was sort of defensive point, but the former point made me wonder how non-conformist this is. Or is it really, outside maybe free trade, what Alfred Roberts is preaching is what a 19th century Anglican vicar, Tory vicar, would have agreed with, and actually it's a common tradition. Um, that's a really good point, and the first thing I would say is um, that Mrs. Thatcher is a Wesleyan Methodist, mm, rather than a primitive Methodist, which is of course a very different separate tradition um, and in fact, Methodism um, doesn't uh, unify in Grantham until 1945. It actually unifies nationally in 1932. So the distinction is still an important one, even when she's a uh, child and, and, and right up until she leaves Grantham for Oxford. It's very important that she's a Wesleyan Methodist because, in a way, they're the most conformist of all non conformists. Wesley, and Wesley himself was a Tory. Um, in terms of the vote, if you look at the voting patterns mm. of Wesleyan um, Methodists throughout the 19th century, um, well, from the mid 19th century, they are invariably the least likely of the non conformists to vote liberal. Mm. They are the most conformist of the non conformists. Um, but the tradition is, is still there. Um, they're not as radical as the Baptists and, you know, um, and the primitive Methodists. Um, and obviously, they're less tied to, therefore, the liberals. And in the 1920s and 30s, Stanley Baldwin himself, a man of Wesleyan heritage, even though he's an Anglican, um, makes a d distinct appeal to men like Alfred Roberts, the Wesleyan Methodist. 
who are the floating Liberal voters at a time when the Liberal Party is collapsing, the Tory Party is trying to assume those votes. It's Baldwin's distinct ability <coughs> to appeal to men like Alfred Roberts. At a time when actually what happens to the British political system <coughs> is that suddenly your class becomes important, more important as a defining characteristic than your religion. Up until the 19th, you know, let's broadly say, crudely speaking, the 19th century is defined by, um, you know, you are almost defined by your voting habits, to, you know, in your religion. They are one of the same. By the 1920s and 30s, there is a more clear fragmentation happening, which is, is you know, a, a, the rise of class politics in Britain, as you would mass, um, in, in a mass democracy. Um, so Alf Roberts, the most important thing about him is not, therefore, that he's a Wesleyan, it's that he's a grocer, and the biggest threat in Grantham is the co-op. <laughs> so therefore, <laughs> therefore, therefore co-op rather than the Labour Party, and the co-op has representatives on the Grantham Council, which of course he is a member, stands as an independent, um, he moves towards the Conservative Party. Um, but in terms of how conformist, non-conformist his, his kind of sermons are, I think you're right. Um, they are largely out of step with what most Methodists are saying in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Um, Methodists at that, mar at that time are pacifists. Methodists at that time are going on you know, mar solidarity marches with the hunger strikers. Methodists at that time are, you know, um, are uh, you know attacking free trade? So he is out of step with um, the majority of kind of Methodist teaching. If you read the proceedings of the um, the Wesleyan you know annual conference, you get a sense that the Robertses are really quite old school when it comes to the way they <coughs> they they speak about their faith, the way that they worship, and their their uh, their, their political outlook as well. Um, so I think they are actually. How non-conformist is it? I don't think it's particularly representative. I think that's why um, it's, it's representative of the father rather than representative of Methodism. And any any charge that Mrs. Thatcher was a Methodist is, you know, Methodists take it really badly. Margaret <laughs> 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 yeah, Thatcher being a Methodist. Last question, Richard. That's very briefly. And um, daughters of the. Uh, John, John Wesley, we have many things to thank John Wesley for. Um, on the light-hearted side, uh, we can thank him for preserving us against revolution, as in France. And on one very famous occasion, he, together with George Whitfield and the Countess of Huntington, summoned a prayer meeting to pray against the French and for the protection of uh, England from France. So uh, we can thank him for that. Uh, but more importantly, uh, relating to uh, tonight, John Wesley preached a very famous sermon on the right use of money, um, and depending which volume you look in, it's got a different number, but it's sermon number 50 in most volumes. Um, and he had three sections to that sermon, yeah. and it was earn all you can, uh, save all you can, and give all you can. So earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And I wonder whether that's the, the origin of these uh, values that we're talking about, and actually it's the interaction of those values, particularly the first two, but including the responsibility of the third, between the earning all you can, the enterprise, of business, the economy, and saving all you can, the principles of thrift, that we see uh, played out in Margaret Thatcher, but also what we see fail to be played out in modern Christian leadership from the Church of England and Methodism, uh, where they will often uh, not be interested in the enterprise and the earning and the responsibility of wealth creation and only interested in its distribution. And isn't the beauty, both of Margaret Thatcher's values, but also going back to that sermon in John Wesley, was the ability to combine that value of enterprise, the value of thrift, and then the value of responsibility. And it's actually the interaction of those things together that give you uh, that really strong value system. I think writing in 1988 to um, William Wargrave, she, um, Margaret Thatcher said, the church keep on telling us we're making everyone poor, and then when we make everyone rich, they tell us we're making everyone materialistic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that, um, 
you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And I think one of the, the things that I do in the book is, is, is really contrast the theology of Margaret Thatcher with the theology of the Church of England, because they are completely different. And interestingly, Robert Brunsey and Margaret Thatcher first have their first encounter at Oxford, um, and he is the sort of representative of the Carlton Club um, <coughs> that sits on the Conservative University Association, and she boots him off um, for his apparently frivolous attachment to politics. Um, and there <laughs> begins a fractious relationship, which obviously, which obviously sort of reached its kind of climax in the 1980s, first over the Falklands War, notorious pacifist sermon in 1982, but also um, the Faith in the City report. And, and the Church of England was very much projecting um, a view that was basically a reinstatement of kind of the consensus politics that had governed Britain really since 1945, um, heralding the welfare state as a sort of sort of institutional demonstration of the sort of love thy neighbour principle and not really thinking about or considering or giving due appreciation to the creation of wealth. And that's the fundamental flaw in the church's theology, is that they do not even fathom or consider that there might be, you know, a gospel for the rich. And therefore not even historically accurate, going back to those values inculcated by Wesley and well, I think, uh, but on the uh, flip side, I think um, if we're, we're saying earn all you can, give all you can, save all you can, it was only, you know, it was only really the first one, I think, that was ever sufficiently encouraged in Thatcher's Britain. If we're going to, you know, attack the church on, on, on Wesley's uh, criteria, I think you should also attack Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher often quoted the, uh, the sermon and the, the, the kind of the, the three things that he asked uh, was the appropriate use of money, but it was only ever the earn all you can that was encouraged. Save all you can, give all you can. If you look at statistics on charitable giving in the 1980s, where is the rise occurring? It's in marketing budgets for national charities. So everyone thinks, well, hang on, charitable giving must have increased in the 1980s. We had comic relief, we had children in need, we had, you know, live aid. No, what actually happens is people which start giving to national charities rather than local charities. And actually still, even by the end of the 1980s, the chiefest, the, the, the largest, largest givers are those in the North and um, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Principally those that have that benefited least from you know, the Thatcher boom and you know, the cutting uh, income tax. And also um, those that we have to let uh, Eliza some time for the signing of the and I promise to order a very last question and then... Um, it's not so much a question, it's a comment. Um, Eliza, you made, <coughs> I think, a very pertinent observation that Thatcher was more a person of beliefs than ideas. And you only had to meet her for five minutes to know what those beliefs were. <laughs> But she had enormous self-discipline in not ramming those beliefs down people's throats in her job as a politician and a, a, as a political leader. And the nearest I ever heard her describe, discuss anything religious, um, and I spent quite a bit of time with her, but it was true, it was on business issues, um, was when she said that socialism had nationalized compassion. And that went to the heart. That, that, that remark has stuck with me ever since. Um, by the way, there was a remark that you made, I think, that um, Thatcher was an anachronism. <laughs> I think that's the last thing she was. She sent the clock hurtling forward, and the anachronisms mm -hmm. have been the people who have led the country ever since. <laughs> 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 uh, why, why, uh, 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 we should, we, we pretty should uh, uh, conclude that. Um, <laughs> do, 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 uh, by this book, not least because it's brilliantly researched, brilliantly written, uh, it has some most brilliant, uh, it also has some fantastic quotations. I'm just going to read out one at the very end, one with which I hasten to say I completely disagree, but it is, uh, 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 but it might, might um, uh, illustrate the, the breadth of uh, Elijah's great work. Uh, this is Peregrine Worstall, uh, who 
as Eliza says rather bluntly surmised, Margaret Thatcher had set out to create a country in the image of her father, but ended up in creating one in the image of her son. But not only with God and economics uh, and politics, but also uh, 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 we will see when you buy the book that uh, it's brilliant to read as well. Thank you very much for coming. And thank